Come on, let's give it up for Jesus in this place. I know y'all didn't come to see me, because all I got to tell you about is what he did. So come on, let's give it up for Jesus. We love you, Lord. We need you, Lord. We came to hear from you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, press in with me. Come on, press in with me. Come on, press in with me. Hallelujah. We bless you, Lord. We need you, Lord. We can't do it without you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You all can be seated. You can all be seated. I know if I keep going, I'm going to cut into my timing. You know I got something to say. Right? Some people got something to say, but some people just want to say something. I got something to say tonight. <laughs> Before I go any further, I want to give honor where honor's due. As you guys seen, you've seen a little bit of my story. And when I touched down here eight years ago, we're going into nine years this November, I was subjected to a consistent level of leadership. Pastor Marco, Pastor Lisa, Robert and Veronica, our leaders and the leaders under them have stayed in position and have been consistent and allowing God to use them. And because of that, when I came forward, I was able to grow and develop and come to this point now where I get an a, a opportunity to share with you guys, share the same pulpit as one of, I believe, one of the greatest leaders in this world. And so if you've been touched by God through the leadership here, through our pastors, I want you to just take some time and celebrate him with us. Let's give honor where honors do. We love you, pastor. We, pre we appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. All of our leaders here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you. I received that. Well, let's get right into this for y'all get me started. You know, I'm blaming it on you guys, right? So I'm going to open up in some prayer and um, I'm going to be reading from Deuteronomy 32, 1 and 2. Listen, O heavens, and I will speak. Hear, O earth, the words that I say. Let my teaching fall on you like rain. Let my speech settle like dew. Let my words fall like rain on tender grass. Let gentle showers on the young plants. I will proclaim the name of the Lord. How glorious is our God. He is the rock. His deeds are perfect. Everything he does is just and fair. He is a faithful God who does no wrong. How just and upright is he. Have your wonderful way in the name of Jesus. Amen. So tonight, you guys, I'll start a little bit with talking about my life and, and, and where I came from and how I got to this point. But more importantly, I want to give you some practical steps at the end of this testimony on not just the great things that God did, but how he did it. Because you don't need to just hear the great things that God has done in my life, but you need to know how you can get that guaranteed transformation. Because tonight's message title is not just transformation, it's guaranteed transformation. See, we hear about transformation, but in Christ we have the ability to have guaranteed transformation. That means that there's no way it can fail. And so I'm confident in this message that I get to share with you because it has brought me here and it has kept me in this place. Going back to growing up, I was actually born in Louisiana. A lot of people don't know that. I lived there for about a year, 10 months to a year, and I moved to the Dino, San Bernardino. And I've been here ever since. I, my biological father, he's been out there in Louisiana the whole time. I've probably had about 10 conversations with um, my, my father and I've never known him. We've never had any relationship because he chose a lifestyle of hustle and streets and he's actually in prison to this day. In and out, in and out, in and out. And um, moving forward, my mother, very hardworking woman. I don't know, are you in the house? I ain't gonna do you like that today, mama. I think I, inv I invited her out. She's probably in here somewhere, right? But anyways, my mom, you know, very hardworking woman. She provided for us and did everything she could as a single mother. 
But the thing was is she, she lacked a relationship with the Lord. Therefore, she was unsatisfied and unfulfilled. And that led to open doors in her life, open doors of toxic relationships, substance abuse, different things that brought trauma, not only to her and pain and hurt to her, but also to her children. There was a moment at 12 years old and I remember this moment, I, there were a couple things that happened specifically, but I, I wanna really talk about this gateway that things really opened up for me to start tapping into another level of this street life and this identity crisis that I was developing. Because although I did have a stepfather there, and you know what? He did the best that he could do. But you know what he did? He did and he gave to me what he had. And he wasn't given anything. So he taught me how to do the wrong thing the right way. He taught me the streets, the hustle, how to survive in the streets. He was a gangster, he's a hustler. And that's what he gave to me. And so this was, I was exposed to at a young age. And at 12 years old, I remember I had a friend of mine um, <laughs> hanging out with people that were older than me. I was about 12 years old, between 12 and 13. And like I said, I lived in San Bernardino pretty much my whole life this year. For two years, we moved in Fontana, a couple miles over. And for two years in sixth and seventh grade, in that sixth grade year, I had a friend of mine, David Ortiz, I'll never forget him. He went to full high, he was in high school. And he was selling weed. And one day, my friend, I went to his house, he had a big bag and I stuck my hand in there and I actually stole it from my friend, right? This was the day that I activated the thief in my life. And I put these nuggets of marijuana in my pocket and I went home and I told some of my other older friends. And Karen and Gustavo, they, they, they were in eighth grade. And Karen told me, when my boyfriend gets here, he's going to buy that from you. So what I did was I took a couple of those nuggets, I put them in my pocket, and I sold them this sack. And I made $10 and I had a little sack of weed. Now at that time, I wasn't into the drugs and, and getting high. Um, I wasn't, money had no real value for me or meaning, but it was at that moment when I tasted, it, I tasted what it felt like to make some money. I had that weed. I got some foil and made the little pipe and smoked it and I felt good because sin feels good. It's pleasurable for a moment, but what that led to, and I fought this for many years about saying marijuana is not a gateway drug. For many years, I fought this. But what it did is not only did it open up to more hardcore drugs, like smoking PCP and Sherm, because that weed wasn't enough. But what it did was it opened up a gateway to another lifestyle, another level of the streets. Because now I'm young, I'm 12, turning 13. And now I'm selling drugs. So now I'm in the streets and there's other people who are selling drugs in the streets. And there's other people that are living on another level of this life. And there's gangsters and they have guns and, and, and they're hitting licks and robbing. And so what did I do? I got involved in those things all because I started selling weed. And it was a gateway to another level of street life. During that time, as you know, when we're committing crimes, living a lifestyle of foolishness, it's gonna lead to either death or prison. And so for me, I started going to juvenile hall. Juvenile hall, county, county, uh, prison, got shot, got stabbed, back to prison. The cycle, you guys know it. This, I'm not telling you anything you don't know about that cycle. And I was in that cycle, I was a product of it feeding and developing the identity crisis to make sure that you knew that I was something that I really wasn't. Bad actor. I'll tell you some more about that later. But it came to a point in 2009, I, at that moment, as I shared in here, I got shot and I was on parole. I was just out a couple months and there's something called negative police contact. And what happened was for the first time in my life, here I am, I'm a victim of a crime. And I got a parole violation for getting shot. So I'm back in Chino on a violation. But then I also was living in such a level of deception. I literally thought I was living a different life because when I got out of prison that last time, I told myself I'm no longer a gang banger, I'm a gang member. And so what that meant was, is I was, I was um, <laughs> this is the thing, I was no longer turned up, I was turned down, right? And, and in Christ, we would call that lukewarm. So I thought that, yeah, I wasn't selling drugs anymore, but I had some of my homies selling drugs. I got the drugs, I gave it to them, they sold it. I wasn't selling drugs. I wasn't running around with guns anymore and red rags in my packet. It, no, it wasn't that no more. What I was doing was, is I was putting those guns up at my mama's house. 
right? But, but in my mind, I was living a different lifestyle. Oh, that was so great of a deception that I lived in. Because as soon as I got shot and I received that parole violation and I was sitting in prison, what do you think happened? Well, the police just, you know, I don't know why they went to my house. It had nothing to do with it. And guess what they found at my mama's house? Some guns and some drugs. So here I am sitting on a violation with a new beef, a new, a new charge in the county of jail. And prison and the, and, and the lifestyle of it, I had grown comfortable with. I learned how to do it. We learned how to do that. And to be honest with you, um, I never really did hard time. One day is hard time. One day is hell. But for me, I had family. I had money. I was getting high. I would drink. I would smoke. I knew people. I was on cell phones. I had access to those things, and I was living the same way in there as I was on the street. So it wasn't as hard, if you understand what I'm saying. So while I'm in this cycle, I find myself back into that prison right there at Chino on a violation, raiding to go to the county and fight this case. And during that moment, for the first time in my life, I'm sitting there and I was thinking about my thoughts. I was very animalistic where I would just respond on how I felt or what I, a thought would come and I would just move. That's like a dog. You know, a dog might not mean to bite you, but if you step on him, he might snap at you. He just, it was a response, right? So like, that's how I was. So you know, I had a lot of mistakes and failures because I didn't think things through. And so in that moment, I was sitting there thinking in this cell, um, we had Chino riots, the West Yard, it was super crazy. And everybody was on lockdown. I'm in the cell. And I get this thought. I get this thought in my mind. And I hear this voice. At the time, I didn't know God. I wasn't raised in church. We didn't have any background of church. There was none of that growing up. And so I get this thought. And I'm just thinking it's my thought. And I hear this voice say, your way's not working. And I literally, in that moment, and you know how the thoughts are. You could think a whole scenario in just a moment. And in that moment, I literally, when I heard that voice say, your way's not working, I thought about my thought, and then I seen juvenile hall, county jail, prison, staff, shot, you're back. And I realized for the first moment that my way wasn't working. <laughs> Crazy, right? And that was the first revelation that I received from God. And I want to talk a little bit about the, the word revelation as I go into this, because I originally named this message three revelations that changed my life but I had to change it to guarantee transformation because the, the revelation without me taking specific steps would have meant nothing. Revelation. Definition. A surprising and previously unknown fact, especially one that is made known in a dramatic way. The divine or supernatural disclosure to humans of something relating to human existence or the world. And, and my God-given, God revealed this to me one day. The word revelation, it means life-changing information. I'm not just talking about Taco Bender has bomb corn asada uh, or, or, or pork chili fries. Like that, that was revealed to me. No, 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 that ain't, that's not life-changing. That, that's, you know, that's, that was revealed to you, but that's not God revelation. Right? We talk about, we need some things that's going to change our life. That's going to position us so that there could be a shift. And so this revelation that I received was my way wasn't working. And I realized that because I was doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Some of you know that as the word insanity, right? I hear some of you saying it already. Also, listen to this definition of insanity. It is a mental illness of such a severe nature that a person cannot distinguish fantasy from reality. Oh my goodness, when this spoke, this speaks to me. I had a mental illness of such severe it was so severe that I could not distinguish. That means I couldn't tell the difference between fantasy and reality. Now, let's talk a little bit about what fantasy means. Fantasy, imagining things. Especially things that are impossible or improbable. See, it was a fantasy that I can continue to live the same life, style, and do it over and over again and get different results. And this was the funny part. No, it's not. It's really sad. Look, I believed and I knew that my lifestyle was going to lead to prison forever or, or, or death. I knew that and I accepted that. But the fantasy was, is that that was just it. That was just it. The reality was, is that I was not only going to be experiencing prison forever 
or, 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 or receiving death. But the reality was is that my mother was going to have to experience some of this prison. And my daughter may be out there on baseline experiencing some prison. And the reality was my little cousins that were on the east side of town, because I swore I was a west side baby from, you know, mama ain't never had not one house on the west side. But I stood on them blocks and I blocked it up. I'm in the hood. I would get on homies' heads from not coming to the block just to prove that I was something that I wasn't. Didn't own not one house on the west side. So my cousin's on the east side and he's banging the neighborhood using my name. And in the fantasy that I was living on is that he was not going to die behind trying to follow my steps. That was the reality. And I could not distinguish the difference between the two. He revealed to me that I was not who I thought I was. There were two things that I thought I was. I didn't know anything about myself, but one, I believed that I was a family man. And two, I believed that I rolled out my own beef, AKA I took my own responsibility. But you see, God revealed to me that that's not who I am because my choices were directly affecting my mother. My mom was doing time every time. I remember one time my mom even got hit by a police officer because she called herself protecting her baby. And I'm running around acting a fool and they need to be protecting the people from me. <laughs> She's over here getting, man, the things that my mother went through and would fight, stand up to the police. Man, mama, man, mama, thank you so much for never giving up on me. Thank you so much for never giving up on me. She was there when I got out of prison every time, man. And so that first revelation led me to this moment. And I promise in this moment, when I had that thought and I had that vision, my way's not working. I see my lifestyle. He, I, I knew in that moment I was not who I thought I was. Right after that, I literally said these words. I don't even know why. I could say now it was God, of course, but I had no recollection. It's, and I said this, okay, God, show yourself. That's what I said. That was my Romans 10, 9, and 10. That was my altar call right there. Alpine 113 low, e -shore. On a reception center, waiting to go back to the county. And I didn't do it because I was done with the lifestyle. I love the lifestyle. The homies, the hood, the block, I love that. Why do you think I spent the first five years just really developing um, um, good company outreach and serving and giving my life to that and laying my life down? I love going out there with them. Now I'm in the prison. Why? Well, how do you think I got to that point? I love going in there. Right? Obviously, something wrong with him. But God turned it around for good. <laughs> so while I'm sitting there, I said, okay, God, show yourself. I don't know how I got this Bible in my cell. I promise you, I don't know why. I don't even know. Remember, you guys have your, you seen the little blue? No, they're red now. It was a little blue Gideon's uh, motel version Bible. No commentary, no cross-reference, just scripture. Just scripture. And I would read it. I was programming, you know, for my serenials. They say, you're doing a rotina, right? I'm doing a rotina. I'm lit. I do my workout. I will read my scripture. I do my prayer. I will write my letter. How you think years go by? How you think we do time? Got to do something, right? And a part of my routine was reading that word. I started praying. I didn't know how to pray. I remember, look, checking this out. When I was going back to that moment, I seen people pray and I heard of people praying and they didn't get what they want when they had wanted it and how they wanted it. They turned their back on God. They were mad. So when I came to God in that moment and I said, okay, God, show yourself. Do you know I never asked for anything? Almost my first year of my walk, but he gave me everything. I would pray things for like my daughter and stuff like that, but I didn't ask for nothing because I knew if I don't get what I want, I'm going to be hot with God. So I'm not asking him. <laughs> you better know I'm knocking now. I'm seeking now. I'm asking now. I know better, but I'm just saying he worked with me and met me where I was at. By the way, by the way, I told you I was getting high and drinking, blowing up Pruno every weekend. Some of y'all don't know what that is. It's just liquor, just liquor, making liquor. I'll tell you about it. Ask me later on about it. But I was getting drunk every weekend. And in this moment, I said, okay, God, show yourself. But I started praying and I started reading. I'm on lockdown. Nobody's discipling me. Nobody's showing me. Nobody's teaching me. No church. And I, I remember this day I'm sitting there and I feel this sorrow come over me and I almost feel like crying. But I didn't know what was up because things weren't bad. I mean, I was in prison. That's bad. But, you know, this is normal. And I'm like, and then I'm saved now, though. I didn't know I got the spirit in me, so I'm really good. I still got immaturity issues and things of that sort. You know, we still got to grow. 
but I'm sitting here and I'm feeling bad. And I realize in this moment, as I'm sitting there in my thoughts, I'm like, I realized that I was put in the neighborhood before myself as a man. And I felt shamed of that. I felt, I felt sorrow of, over that. Like I'm putting my neighbor, I'm trying to prove and I'm doing time. And even that moment was a part of me trying to prove something that I wasn't. And I'll never forget that day. You guys know the, uh, the little daily breads? You guys remember those? Some of y'all that have been in the pen know what I'm talking about. Do they have them out here? The little book, you look at a little scripture. So in that daily bread, I don't remember the story, but there were three scriptures. I'll never forget them. In that moment, the first scripture that I read, it was 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 11. And it was talking about, he's saying, hey, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, understood as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things, right? And I read this, and I was like, okay, I'm like, all right. Like, I didn't really get it, but I hear, like, when you become a man, like, maybe that's what you're supposed to do when you become a man. You put away childish things. It was the next verse that I read. It was in John 17. And, and Jesus was speaking. He said, I am in you, and, 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 and you are in me. And I was like, okay. I'm like, all right. And then the last, the last scripture, it was in, it was Genesis uh, 126. And God was speaking, and he said, let us create him. Let us create them in our image and in our likeness. And in that very moment, see, this was the first time that I found out that God spoke to me and I didn't understand because I always heard about people like talking, they pray, they have dreams. Like my wife, she dreams and God will speak to her. It don't happen to me. I sleep and I wake up. I don't remember nothing. If you got a problem sleeping, I got that power, that anointing. God gave it to me. I will have you sleeping. You won't remember nothing. You gonna wake up good to this day. To this day, I don't remember nothing. I just wake up. But what I found out is I daydream. God speaks. I do. God does give me visions, but during the day. And in this moment, right after I read that daily bread, there was a vision that popped up in my mind. There was three pictures that came up. It was a picture of me smoking, a picture of me drinking, and there was a picture of me. And it's funny because how visions are, I knew what it was. It was a picture of me talking crazy, cussing and stuff. But it was just a picture. And it was like, boom, boom, boom. And then literally there's this big white hamburger helper hand. And it went and it swiped all three visions. It swiped all three of them up and I heard this word. I heard this word. It said, I took that too. I took that too. And no, no, this is crazy. So check it out. I got to give you guys some insight. So we do strange things. Incarceration people do we do, right? So I'm sitting in there and check this out. I'm reading the different dictionary, right? I'm reading. I'm literally reading it. Right? So this week, I just learned that there were three types of twos. There's two. Like T-O, I'm going to the, right? And then also we have T-W-O, like give me two cups of water because my mouth is dry. And then look, then we got T-O-O is also. And so when Jesus, I know it was him now, when he said I took that too, I knew he was saying T-O-O and he was telling me in that very moment. Remember when I told you I was sitting there feeling sorrowful because I realized I realized this was my second revelation. I realized that I was putting God, I was putting my neighborhood before myself as a man of God. He was showing me that what he did was he took the desire out of me for that. And then I started looking at my life. I was like, dang, I haven't smoked. I haven't drank in like three weeks. And, and I, I wish my story was, I just, I was done with it. And I told God I'm finished. I didn't. I didn't. I can't, that's not my testimony. Like he literally just took it from me. I don't even have no desire for it. Like, I can't even resist that because it's not even a temptation. Smoking, drinking. There's some other things God dealing with me in, right? But those things, smoking, drinking, cussing, like, that ain't a problem. I took that too. You guys, as that vision came to me, it led to the third revelation. The third revelation, because the first one was realizing that my way wasn't working. And literally, it wasn't working, but I didn't know, so it don't matter, right? right. Everybody else around me knew it. Right. Right. <laughs> I accepted it. Okay, my way isn't working. Okay, show yourself. Then he showed me this was an area because now I'm reading and I'm praying. Right? I'm in my cell by myself. We're talking about the first year of my walk. This is literally, this is the first three months of my walk. I'm sitting here, and then he reveals to me, this is the thing. And those scriptures... What he revealed was, he said, look, 
In, in, in 1 Corinthians 13, when he said, when you were as a child, you spoke and you understood as a child, but when you became a man, he was showing me and he said in, 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 in um, John chapter 17, how he said, I am in you and you are in me. God revealed to me that as I got to know God, I got to know who I am. And that's why I, was, I came to that point where I realized that I was, I was doing what I was putting in the neighborhood before myself as a man of God. I, I started to realize who I really was in Christ because of me getting to know who God is. It was crazy. It blew me away. And then he said, I created you in my image and likeness. I realized that I was created in God's image and likeness. So all he's trying to do is bring me back to what he desired in the first place. So what I was doing, I was literally fighting against. And I know now from the fall of man, all we did was we fell away from our original DNA. We fell away from our original identity. And I was building off of that false identity. But God had told me, he said, I'm like your hustle, like the way you hustle and the way you speak and you're bold and the way you try to call shots. And he said, I, I, the way you plot and all that sitting in trash cans and waiting to jump out on folks and do crazy stuff like that type of crazy stuff. He said, I, I, that was perverted by the enemy. I created you. I need you to be able to hustle that gospel. I need you to be able to share that word at any moment, in season, out of season. I need you to be bold. I need you to be able to step to the plate and let them know about me no matter where you at or what you're going through. I need you to be able to plot and pray and fast and be up at three in the morning tripping on that devil and keeping them underneath your feet. I need you. I was built like this, but I was perverted and I didn't know no better. But revelation number three was when he revealed that to me in that moment, I'm explaining it. it. took me 10 minutes to explain that. But what I'm saying to you is that all came to me in a moment. In a blink of a thought, I got all that understanding. And it led to my third revelation. I knew that I knew that God and his word was real. I knew that I knew that God and his word was real. Now, moving forward real quick. Of course, I had to spend a little over three more years in the institution there. Um, I continued on that same path doing what I needed to do as a disciple. I uh, came off that prison, ended up going to another one. Transition, I, as you know, I touched down here, 2012, November 4th. And I've been here eight years, going on nine years. And as we do in Christ, when you're serving the Lord, things just get better and better. Through trial and error and tribulation, coming home with just one pair of shoes and two outfits, like, like things got better. And I, I don't even, I got, man, pray for my shoes. I got shoes. Y'all need side third, I got you. Right, I got shoes, man. I, I got things like, like, like a wife and, and the kids and, and, and just all these different things that started developing. We got some pictures I want to show real quick. I got some pictures. I just want to talk about some achievements that God took me from. Wow, look at that. We got our very own pastor. Look, that's my wife right there. We just celebrated five years, right? Um, my husband, I ain't never had an example of no husband. Right, that's the next one. Look at my family. Look, I went from, look, single daddy. I have one daughter, my oldest, and my wife had one daughter. We get married, and then I went from single daddy to, to, to family of four. Family of four. And then look at my little Zoe and my Silas. We just had them back to back. They're one and two. So here I'm a family of six. Now I'm a, I'm a husband. I'm a father. Right? We got another. We got some other. Let's go in here. Let's flip through those other ones real quick. What else happened? Oh, that's a couple of my pair of 12 guys right there. We just digging in. We ain't praying every week, grinding in the Lord, right? Nothing don't matter. Nothing stopping out. What else we got? That's freedom at the way, team. We not just meet no Sunday. We getting it in outside the church. We are not forsaking the fellowship of one another, right? Keeping Jesus in the center. Is there another one after that? Oh, what's up, Brian? Good to see you, brother. That's my buddy, too. I remember when he first came. He actually, I remember when I met his wife. He brought him out to outreach, and I was training him in his how to do outreach. So thank you, Lord. That was a blessing that I got to share with him. So anyways, as I come down to a close, these achievements, they didn't come by my own good deeds. And I like, Maurice, I hear you, bro. Thank you for sharing that story. God is good. But, but some of you out there like, but, but practically, how did you do it, though? I'm glad you asked. I really appreciate that because right now I need you to forget all of that other stuff I just told you about. Because this last portion, this is the last portion that you need to take. This is what is essential to every single one of our lives here now and will forever be. These four ingredients will lead to what I call guaranteed transformation. Number one is prayer. Jesus said in Luke 18, 1, that men ought to always pray and not lose heart. In Galatians 6, 9, it says, do not grow weary while doing good, for in this due season, you will reap a harvest. 
if you don't lose heart. Lose heart means don't give up. So prayer is directly correlated with not giving up. So I started praying. Remember I told you I didn't even know how to pray, but it, that prayer replaced something else in my life, which I didn't tell you, but I'm going to tell you at the end of this four. There were other things. There were, it was a replacement. It's in the world. They talk about replacement therapy. So prayer was number one ingredient. Every one of us need to have a prayer life daily, all day, not just in the morning and at night before we go to bed. Two, reading the word. John 6, 63, I love this. Jesus said, it's the spirit that gives life. He says, the flesh profits nothing. Jesus said, the words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. Remember, I told you when I got to know who Jesus was, I got to know who I was, and then I was able to pursue and obtain a life that was way higher than I ever imagined. I can't believe I'm here for you guys. I never would have thought of that. I never would have considered that. But through the reading of the word, prayer, reading of the word, that's ingredient number two. Ingredient number three is fellowship. Fellowship, Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. And let us consider thoughtfully how we may encourage one another to love and to do good deeds. 25, pay attention. Not forsaking, that means not turning your back on, or not forsaking our meeting together as believers for worship and instruction. As is the habit of some, nobody here though, but encouraging one another and all the more faithfully as you see the day of Christ's return approaching. And also Romans 10, 17 say faith Faith, which we need to be saved to move a mountain, right? Without faith, it's impossible to please God, right? So how do, how do we develop faith? Faith's like a muscle. How do I build faith? Faith come by hearing and hearing of the word of God. So fellowship is Jesus in the center. It's me coming. It's not just me coming to service because I have to come here to hear the word so my faith can be built up, but it's me also learning how to speak the word because I'm speaking the word out my mouth and I build myself up in my faith, but it's also showing up in your power 12. It's also digging in that time and you giving God opportunity to use you to serve in ministry. That's fellowship. That's fellowship. That's ingredient number three. Ingredient number four, the last, and probably the, one of the best ones, fasting. Fasting. I may not have mentioned a little earlier, but when I was, when I got, when, when I literally, I was in that cell, one day I read in, in Isaiah chapter 58, and I read about fasting. I knew nothing about fasting. All I knew, one of my partners, he was one of my buddies, AKA buddies. He was a, he, he was a, he was a Muslim. And I knew about fasting. I knew they just didn't eat during that time. I knew nothing else. So I'm reading in this, this chapter of 58. I, I, I implore, I encourage every one of you to read chapter 58. Because through the first um, verses, one through seven, it's going to tell you how to act during a, a fast. See, I knew not to eat. I knew about that part, but anybody can, can resist food. Anybody can not eat. But one through seven is going to how to act during your fast. And then you got eight through 14 is going to talk to you about the benefits and the promises that are released by God because of fasting. And so it was these four elements, these four ingredients that led to the guaranteed transformation in my life then. And I promise you that it's actually working for my good to this very moment. I bet you pastor will agree. I bet you he prayed, read his word, fellowship and fast. He don't stop that. And every single one of you that are here today, that God has done something in you special. You guys, I'm going to close on this note. <laughs> This is a wonderful, wonderful opportunity for me. And I'm speaking to a couple groups of people first who I want to speak to in this moment. See, some of you have a loved one that's in and out of prison. Someone's in there right now. And they may be in prison. Matter of fact, come on, let's be real. I know some of y'all watching and y'all locked up right now. I already know. Because I was on the telephone all day. We call it the cuerno. We, we was on that phone too. I picked up all the, the words. You know, I was always tight. See, I'm light-skinned, so I just fit in. Depends on who's deeper, right? Some of y'all people know, right? Be like, yeah, you know, when I was in Fontana, I identified with the Hispanics, right? I didn't know who I was. I wish I had that picture. I'll show you. I had that T-shirt with the little thing down the middle, right? The belt with the buckle on it. I was Mexican. I was lying. I ain't Mexican. Black and white. You know what I mean? But for sixth and seventh grade, I was. You couldn't tell me no different, right? I know who I am now, black and white. I ain't even black and white. I'm a man of God. I'm strong in the Lord. I'm chosen by God. I'm faithful. I'm justified. I'm worthy. And I could do all things through Christ who strengthened me, so it don't even matter. 
This is who I am according to him. And for you that are in this place and you're struggling with seeing your family, because some of us say, hey, you know, this church, it's, it's jailhouse religion, and I understand that. And there's a battle and there's a struggle in that moment. There's a battle, and, and, and you know what? Let's just take it a little closer, right? There's some people that you see that are out there and they're bound and they're in drugs, right? And they're on and off. And you might be in this place and you're in and out of prison. You're on and off drugs in this place. And you can't see yourself getting a guaranteed transfer. You can't see a guaranteed nothing but going back to jail and probably dying soon. I just come up here as an example to let you know it's possible. Okay, so I just want to deal with those people right now. Those in here, those of you who have family and loved ones, that's out there. And then I got two other very important individuals I'm going to be speaking to. You know this is altar time. You know this is that time when I'm about to, I'm going to give God his opportunity to do what he needs to, to get you to where you need to be so that you can be transformed in that attitude where you could be transformed in that marriage so you could be transformed and be brought from darkness into light. We don't have to tiptoe around this family. And some of us are believers in here already. And Maurice, I'm saved. I read my word. But if we're really honest, because I only speak from a place of personal experience as a leader in position, teaching, deliverance, and casting out demons. But the moment I stop one of these four ingredients or I'm not consistent in it, I promise you things get out of order. Being here, you may be struggling with an attitude right now. And you have not been able to get over that. It could be an addiction. You're saved. You know the word. But you can't get over this fear. You just will not sign up for discipleship classes. You just will not finish the process. You need some transformation. And I'm speaking to you, family. Because this very ingredient, these four ingredients are necessary. And if you were to tell me you were struggling in a specific area, I would literally go down this list and see how your prayer life is. See how your time of spending in the word. This is all devotion. I see where you're at with your fellowship. Serving, a church attendance, giving. That's all fellowship and fasting. And I guarantee one of those areas will be off. You'll be like, yeah, I got all those other ones. But fasting, bro, I just, oh, man. Okay. There's an area that God desires. Because remember, this. I want you to know this. This word, you guys. It's not about rules and regulations. It's not about a standard. It's a blueprint on how God desires to manifest his miracles. He does not move any way outside of it. And so that might be you today, and you're saying, I do need some transformation in these areas. I'm struggling. And then last and most important, somebody out there saying, Maurice, I hear your story, but I don't even really, if I was to be honest with you, I don't even hear God. So I'm questioning whether I'm saved or if I even, I I'm here and, and I hear all the good things you're saying and, and I even believe you, bro, and I'm grateful for you. But I've been around this church thing my whole life and I still am not sure sometimes. I'm speaking to you folks that if I were to ask you if you were to die tonight after service and get in a car accident, you may not know for sure 100% that you are guaranteed going to heaven. So I'm speaking to three crowds of people. And I want God just to marinate on your heart because in this moment, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you guys to stand up with me. Not yet, but I'm going to ask you to stand up with me. And then I'm going to give you an opportunity to, like we do, to raise your hand. You know what that's going to do? It's not going to be for me or anybody in here. All you're going to say is, God, I want that transformation. That's all you're going to do. When you do it, I just want you to know you don't have to worry about anybody in here. All you're saying is whatever that area is that you need transformation and you don't just need momentary, you need guaranteed transformation in. I'm going to count to three and you're going to say that's me. Y'all ready? Stand up with me, please. He's ready to do the impossible. Come on. If, if you had doubt, you know, you know he did it through me. And I love the fact that he didn't wait for me to get it all together. I told you I was still drinking and smoking. I told you I was still tripping. And he met me right where I was at. You cannot get right before you come to God. You come to him and then he will help you be right.
That was one of the biggest lies. If I ain't going to do it all the way, I ain't going to do it at all. And so if that's you, and this message spoke to you, and you saying, yeah, for sure, Maurice, I do know I got some areas in my life that I am struggling with. I am saved, but I need some transformation in these parts of my character. I need some transformation, and that's speaking to me. And for the other ones that are saying, you know what, Maurice, I really am questioning my salvation. I'm not really sure. Because all that good stuff you talk about, I have not been able to tap into that, and I've been around this church thing my whole life. You saying I want some of that transformation. I don't even I don't even know Maurice, but I hear you. I want that transformation. I'm a count to 3. And I want you to in faith, not before me, not before man, but before God. You're going to say, "That's me. I want that, Lord." You're going to say, "When you lift your hand, all you're saying is before God. You are taking action." If I didn't take action on the revelations that God gave me, I would still be in that prison and probably be dead. Because that devil tried to kill me. I told you I got shot. I told you I got stabbed. One, you came here for something. You didn't come here just to come and you didn't bring yourself here and the person who brought you didn't force you. You only came because God called you. Two, you're not, there's no confusion in your life anymore. You know this message is for you. Three, go ahead and let the Lord, there he goes. Let the Lord know. Let the Lord know. Let the, this light bright. I don't even need to see it. He sees it. And keep it up. Keep it up. Hold it up. That's me. I want the transformation. That's me. I want it. I want it. I hear it. Now let's take the next step forward and join us on this altar. Come on. We're going to pray together like a family. Come on. Don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Come forward. You raise your hand. Let's go. Let's go. It's that time. Come on. Let's celebrate with a family. Let's celebrate. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Come on. Let's celebrate. If you ain't sweating, you ain't celebrating enough. Come on. Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're stepping into a position to give God opportunity to bring the guaranteed transformation. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Okay, altar workers. We're going we're gonna to pray together. We're going to pray together, altar workers. And you leaders that just came up, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. That's what God needs. You gave him permission. You gave him permission. The rest is up to him. Don't worry about all the fixing and the, he does that. You just give him permission. Okay, I want you guys to pray this prayer with me. Say, Father God, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that you have not given up on me. And I believe that there is guaranteed transformation in you. You died for my sins, my wrongdoings, and you rose on the third day so that I can have a guaranteed transformation and I give you permission now Holy Spirit fill me now with your guaranteed transformation I am a child of God and I'll never be the same I declare and I decree new beginnings in Jesus name I'm saved and I'll never be the same I'm going to heaven and I receive brand new beginnings in Jesus name amen all right, family, thank you so much for this opportunity. Love you guys. I mean, enjoyed that word tonight. Wasn't that great? God bless you guys. You guys have a wonderful night. If anybody needs additional prayer, come on down. We'd love to pray with you guys. Ladies, women, conference this weekend. Don't miss it. We love you guys. If anybody needs prayer, come on down. We'd love to pray with you. God bless you guys. Everybody watch it online. Thank you so much. If you just said that prayer online, go to igotsaved.com, and we'll help you with your walk with Christ. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful night.